foods that's prepared at someone's home um, or just bring your own. But one of these nice, beautiful days um, will put out an invitation and whoever wants to meet up and talk mushrooms um, at a local park, then we'll do it. A um, couple other things. Uh, we've talked about doing some sort of a book review and um, I wanted to bring this one, Mushrooming with Confidence. A lot of people, it's by Alexander Schwab. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, getting into mushroom hunting, um, you know, what, what books do they think would be good for beginners and safe? And this one is great. Um, I've taken Cub Scout troops out uh, using this because the keys are really fantastic. Um, you can go through, make sure you check all of these off and just very helpful. Um, I did not tell the Cub Scouts to eat any of the mushrooms, but we did have a great time identifying them. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in a book, that's my recommendation. Um, and I think that's about all the space that I can take. So um, I believe Miss Kim was going to hop on and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Shana. I appreciate it, uh, especially for the book. Um, always good to know what, what uh, people have read, what they like, and uh, what they don't like. Uh, just a shout out, I want to say that, uh, um, you know, welcome to OMS again. For those that don't know me, my name is Kim Brown, and I am the speaker coordinator here at the group. I have been doing this since about 2000 and eight or 2009, I can't remember. Uh, but I just wanna say that the group is what you make it. Uh, we're all volunteers here. So everything that we do is put on by volunteers. And with that said, uh, especially coming out of COVID, we are really looking for people who wanna step up, who have some great ideas, who wanna help get things started, help support what's going on and um, and one of the first positions that we'd really like to fill is a volunteer coordinator position. So if you're good with people, if you like to see the nuts and bolts of how things work, um, if you really like talking to people, getting to know their personality and are able to then see how they would fit in with what we're, what we're doing, uh, we really want you to step forward. So uh, like I said, the first position is a volunteer coordinator position. And the second position that we're looking for is for someone to assist me doing the speakers. Uh, speaker coordinator, hey, it's a great position. You get to talk to a lot of people. You get to know who's who in the mycological uh, world. And um, deep down, they're just really cool people with a lot of interesting things to say. So with that, uh, I'm going to move right into our presentation tonight. Um, I just wanna say that uh, I met this speaker, oh, a number of years ago at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. and I was absolutely flabbergasted with his talk. I had brought a mushroom novice to, to that festival and uh, he just could not stop talking about everything, everything that was said and everything that was discussed. Um, originally he had thought that, you know, mushrooms were just either to be eaten or to be picked. And our speaker tonight really, really opened that world up to him, uh, not, only, not only just with uh, cultivation, but the possibilities. Uh, that fungi have for us in our in our world today. Um, he goes by many titles, microbiologist, professional mycologist, organic gardener, author, researcher, and entrepreneur. Uh, he's won numerous awards for his work, including the prestigious Clemson University Entrepreneur of the Year Award, the EPA GROU Fellowship Award, and an expert lecturer on all topics, this is true, related to fungi in agriculture and medicine. His primary interest is in low-tech and no-tech cultivation strategies so that anyone can grow mushrooms on just about anything, anywhere in the world. He's been tissue culturing, collecting native fungi in the Southeast and cultivating both commercially and experimentally for more than 28 years. I can't believe that he does look extremely young. So there we go. In 1996, he founded Mushroom Mountain, which he co-owns and operates to explore applications for mushrooms in various industries, 
and currently maintains over 300 species of fungi for food production, microremediation of environmental pollutants, and natural alternatives to chemical pesticides. In 2019, he opened the Blue Portal, a psilocybin research and mediated session center available in Jamaica and soon in Costa Rica. He's currently expanding the 42,000 square feet of the Mushroom Mountain Laboratory and research base near Greenville, South Carolina to accommodate research for commercial production of new and experimental species, as well as, as micro remediation projects. Tonight's speakers, current research projects include bacterial and interactions with fungi and novel antibiotic discovery, as well as target specific entomopathogens to replace chemical pesticides. So I, I greatly and proudly introduce our speaker tonight, Trad Cotter. Thanks, Trad. Trad. My goodness, I, I think I need to shorten that bio, huh? It's crazy. Um, thank you for everybody for coming tonight. Um, man, we're gonna have some fun. All these cool things that mushrooms do. I mean, <laughs> Turn off your phone, turn off the TV, whatever you're doing, stop eating. Uh, just absorb this lecture tonight. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I've got one called Mushrooms, Molds, and Mycorrhizae. This is very similar uh, opportunities with fungi that make a difference. You know, these are, these are um, areas of interest and research with fungi that uh, I feel are important for civilization and uh, for humanity. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kick it off. Uh, I've been mushroom hunting for a long time. I mean, I, I did not get into mushrooms right away. Uh, I didn't learn about mushrooms until I was about 18, 19 years old. You know, I was in a band. I'll let you do the, uh, the calculations there. But I, I went out and I started to see all these different fungi everywhere in the woods and I was out harvesting and trying to identify them and some of you that are watching are experienced you know foraging foragers and I wasn't and some of you have very little experience that are watching but just just learn them one at a time mushroom hunting is, is actually mushroom identification is not that difficult to learn you know 40 species in a year especially the ones that matter, you know, the, the deadly ones, learn the poisonous ones in your area, you know, join a club like the Oregon Mycological Society or wherever you're watching from around the U.S. or the world, you know, try to find an organization near you that you can, you can go out and, and learn from experienced foragers. So uh, this is the way I wake up in the morning every day. Welcome to Mycotopia. You know, this is my dream that we would establish this utopian-like civilization on the planet using mushrooms. Uh, Mushroom Mountain, I actually started in 1996, and it's gone through a lot of changes. Uh, I started in a four by six walk-in closet, and now it's, you know, 50,000 square feet. It's huge, but it's still a, a family-owned farm, <clears throat> and we're expanding to areas of interest here and abroad, uh, like, like like we talked about, um, we do mushroom cultivation research, we do micromediation, <coughs> and also mycotechnology. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about everything here, mostly about remediation technology um, and also mycopesticides. That's why I highlighted that. It's just a huge area of interest in mine and, and uh, novel antibiotics. Mm, I love it. Um, I need to update the slide, I thought I did. Uh, we, we now have over 350 different species of fungi in the lab at Mushroom Mountain, and we keep expanding those. I use them for different trials. I, I look at fungi as an opportunity to like, what kind of problems can they solve? You know, what can we do for mushrooms? What can they do for us? So from a four by six walk-in closet, to 50,000 square feet in just 15 years. I think was a, it, it's a dream come true. You know, so this is a mushroom campus. We have a lab, we have fruiting rooms, we've got a trail. And, you know, now when you come in, 
Uh, if you're ever in the southeast, if you time it right and look at the calendar on Mushroom Mountain, you will see that there are tours available and they are complete tours of the whole facility. You get to see the lab, the fruiting room, the experimental, like everything. All I talk about all the research and everything. So um, if you're a fungophile or mycophile and you are uh, in the area in the southeast, definitely check it out. You can't just drop in and say, I'm on a tour of the farm. It doesn't work that way. Um, they're scheduled tours. But uh, I, 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 I've been hearing reviews about the tours. And I've been growing mushrooms a long time. You know, I've been growing mushrooms for 30 years, uh, legally for 26. And uh, this is right after the Haiti, uh, the Haitian um, earthquake. And I figured out how to grow mushrooms on peanut shells that they had access of in nursery pots. And it only took, you know, two to three weeks to fruit edible protein out of pots, you know, after an earthquake. I mean, this could be used to refugee camps, you know, we are considering the uh, current political crises that are happening right now. You've got refugees, you have uh, people that are wanting food and protein. So I look at all these things and uh, I'm very connected and dialed into the global pulse of what's going on and how mushrooms can help. So uh, Mushroom Mountain kind of split into different organizations, uh, different silos of businesses, cultivation, extractions, medical, remediation, agriculture, and of course, like some nonprofit work that I, that I do. And then I'm like, hmm, moonshot. I, I keep a couple of things close to the chest that, uh, that I do, including the antibiotic research. But we had the opportunity, this is really cool. Uh, several years ago, we were able to, uh, I talked to some SpaceX engineers and another university uh, with some students. And we were able to get some of uh, our mushroom cultures up into space to study how microgravity works with mycelium. So we're still hearing back from those uh, students about the data and how that happened. Um, but mushrooms, I'm telling you, they are easy to grow. They can grow in a lot of different substrates. And I, I think they're the food of the future. So uh, this is in my book. Uh, I might book up put the book title up later. Um, mushrooms produce spores and you don't want spores in space. So we started messing around with liquid cultures. And um, I started making the equivalent of like a tempeh in bags, but I used different types of beans. And then I added cultures, mushroom cultures, not tempeh that produce spores. You don't want spores in space. And so I started culturing liquid cultures here, and then I added um, a, a turkey tail. I added some other different fungi to these cakes, and look what happened to these cakes in about four to five days. Oof, like this. All right. So this is a very good alternative um, as a vegetarian meat substitute, where these cultures can be grown fermented and inoculated in sealed containers, no spores produced, where they produce this tempeh-like cake of a medicinal mushroom meatloaf, you know, vegetarian meatloaf. And this can be grown on agriculture waste here or in space. You know, so sometimes you just have to push the boundaries of what you are trying to accomplish. And, and, and when you think about growing mushrooms in space, people always say, oh, well, why, why do you want to do that? It, it forces the people here on earth to really think about, you know, sustainable options and solutions. So I started looking at, you know, well, mushrooms are, they have these physical properties. Uh, let me get my pointer. And I've got uh, mushrooms. When you find a mushroom and you see them here with these little bundles and you pull a mushroom off a log and you just like rip it off a log and it, it's like really hard to get off that log. Or you pull it out of the mulch and it's got all these little bundles hanging down from it. You know.
Um, not sure if you guys can see me or hear me, but we lost Trad. Um, so hopefully we can get him back. Sit tight. All right, so um, it looks like I might need to admit Trad back on, and I don't totally know how. He's not in the waiting room. Okay. Little play-by-play -play action <laughs> in our technological uh, you know, happenings. Um, let's see. Well, okay. Um, Miss Kim is gonna reach out to him again, and we can just sit tight. So. All right, we're still working on getting him back on. Um, hopefully we don't lose too many people. I think 
once we are able to get him on and going, um, it should continue to be a good presentation. Mushrooms in space, I think that's pretty amazing. Definitely thinking outside the box. Hmm. So uh, we are still waiting. So I will jump on every couple minutes. Um, hopefully not too many more times and uh, get it going again. All right. All right, if y'all are still with us, um, he was able to send us a message. Uh, so apparently there was an outage. Um, he is going to log back in shortly. So don't leave. Use this time to reflect on, you know, your personal journey in life. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Stay with us. Okay, so I was told, um, tell, a, tell a fungi joke. Um, I don't have a joke, but I have a funny story. Oh, we have Trot, he's coming on, I think. We're getting there. So close. Happy to have you back, Chad. We can see you. Oh my gosh. Sorry, guys. 
Well, oh, you know, good. don't you love the drama? Um, can you enable screen sharing for me again, please? Someone? Thank you. Well, you know, I just want to give you guys a break. Yeah. I think we stopped at that slide. Sound about right. Good. All right. <laughs> Listen, you know, mushroom mycelium is so dynamic and, and intelligent. Um, specific cells, the very tips of mycelium are covered with these little bundles and they're able to detect like like just the microchemistry of the environment and they turn on a dime and you know mushrooms create heat carbon dioxide and they sweat kind of like an animal turned inside out and they're territorial they're opportunistic they like to conquer land masses they like resources until they're gone and they'll find a new place to live you know just just like humans, but I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, follow that pathway. So, you know, in my lab, I started to uh, culture mushrooms and test them against different bacteria. And then I tested them, the tensile strength. I was, in, I was interested in how mushrooms hold things together. Now, why is this important? All right. I know it's like, well, I'm foraging mushrooms, I like to eat mushrooms. So why is why, why is holding things together important? Uh, I'll tell you why. It's because that uh, erosion happens. You know, we need, we need new biological adhesives and things like this that are biodegradable and not, not derived uh, with formaldehyde compounds, such as, you know, different things like that. So I found a bunch of mushrooms, went out, I uh, tested them for their gr growth rate for production, tensile rating, and the lower the number, the better. So um, I've got these uh, down here. I've got Lentinus tigrinus, which is the one my mom found. And it was scoring really, really low across the board, antibacterial and chemical factors. So it, it just ended up really low, which is actually really high. And um, that's one of my favorite fungi. It grows really fast. And I put these little pellets at the edge of a petri plate and I make these little arcs and radii and I just uh, watch them grow and, and see how fast they grow and compare them to other mushrooms. But then, you know, a couple of years ago, my well, couple of years ago, or like nine, <laughs> the BP oil spill in the Gulf. What happened there? I mean, really changed my view of how microremediation might work. So we made this America's Most Wanted poster, and I started asking people to look out, be on the lookout for salt-tolerant fungi, and look at this poster. And if you read the first line, that says it all. Anyone can help. The first three words, anyone can help, are empowering. Even if you don't know what you're looking for, anyone can help. If you just find a mushroom growing along the sand, a uh, salt estuary uh, that's salt tolerant. If we get it into culture, it might be a valuable fungus. So this is a community response. This is a uh, citizen that's helping out. And sure enough, we we had mushrooms that are popping out of the dunes and in the in the in the surf, in the sand, you know, in the grass. And these are right. But fortunately, my mom found one. Um, in Key West, Florida, not the turkey tail, but turkey tails are very salt tolerant. They have very high tensile strength. They're very aggressive. Reishi mushrooms, um, these are all medicinal mushrooms, by the way, and all mushrooms are medicinal. <laughs> that uh, these fungi have very high tensile strength, but they're not that fast growing through the. So we start looking at this group, Lentinus and Neolentinus. Um, this is a mushroom that we found up at a state park. And it was growing out of a brand new, like green sticky oozing treated piece of lumber at a state park. Um, I think it was at a horseshoe pit. 
and the barcode, the, the Home Depot barcode sticker was still on the top. And there was these beautiful mushrooms fruiting out of the wood. How does it do that? How does it figure it out? Hmm. You know, we've, we have man-made compounds that have treated wood to resist rot. And yet now these antifungal compounds, these mushrooms have figured out a way around it. It doesn't sound like a, a, a story we haven't heard before, right? And so my mom found this mushroom here, a, a lentinus or neolentinus tigrinus. It's a mushroom that grows uh, all over the southeastern United States in the tropics. And it has a very high tensile strength. The one I talked about before I got cut off was 20 to 30,000 its own weight. This one got tested at 800,000 to 1 million times its own weight. So now it's my new best friend in the lab. And we can use it to broadcast along uh, stream banks, estuaries, just put it right out on cocoa fiber, and it will plasticize this and give, give the shoreline time to recover, you know, to plant plants through this, uh, borderline aquatics and things like this. So, so using fungi in other applications, such as landscaping and erosion control is a very big deal. You know, the upstate South Carolina, where I'm from, the, the top soil was 12 to 15 feet deep uh, 100 years ago. Now it's three to five inches. It's gone. And it, if it takes 500 years to make one inch of soil in a healthy forest, if we did nothing, it would take 79,000 years to put back what we took away in 100. You see? So that's the importance of understanding how to use fungi. And if you're looking at this saying, well, this doesn't apply to me, how about your garden? Go out and add and organic matter and mushroom cultures to your garden, and you can build organic matter and soil for those plants very quickly, not in 500 years. You can do it in 12 months. Now, the mushrooms make that matrix. They make a uh, micron filter of mycelium. And so we started to filter water with these. Now we can use those nursery pots. We grow mushrooms in Haiti or abroad. Let's say you grow them at a refugee camp. There's contaminated water with bacteria in it. All right, there's nothing you can do about chemical contamination that quickly, but bacterial contamination, which is the biggest killer on the planet, um, you can filter out bacterial contamination very quickly, typically within five minutes, just running it through for five minutes, uh, you get a 100 to 1 reduction of, of bacteria if the filter is made right. Now, we've been playing around with sand filters, um, charcoal, mycelium, wood chips, all, all kinds of different filters, and we're constantly doing this type of uh, these bench tests. And so one of the ones that I'm going after is Vibrio cholera. This is, uh, you know, the disease-causing agent of of, um, sorry, uh, in, in certain nations. And so uh, Vibrio cholera actually sticks to chitin, right? It has a binding, it has an adhesion on it that sticks to chitin. Fungal cell walls are composed of chitin. Hmm. <laughs> that was an easy correlation. Uh, this is a slide from one, one of my epidemiology classes at Clemson University, and I asked to have it. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as my professor put it up there, I was like, I got to have that. Oh, my God, mushrooms are made of chitin, right? So it was a beautiful, almost poetic solution to, to, to this. So they are physically trapped. Now they are chemically trapped and adhesed to the mycelium, right? So then um, uh, we had this idea to, hey, we, we, call, we contacted the National Brick Research Center, which just happened to be at Clemson University. I didn't know that. Uh, I was calling all around the state and different states wanting to uh, propose an idea that, hey, we have this fungus that is like, it's crazy. It's 800,000 times its own weight to 1 million times its own weight. And I would love to try to mix this and make a composite material like clay. And nobody would talk to me. And then it turned out it's in my backyard, 20 minutes from my house. So we mixed in 
uh, tiger sawgill, the mushroom my mom found, and they let us use all their equipment, and it wet, it would wet the material uh, to a very specific um, you know humidity, and then it would uh, mix it up. We'd actually add the mycelium, then it would go to a hydraulic press, and look at this beautiful. It made 400 myceliated bricks in an hour, this little machine. And this is a prototype machine, right? So what we did was we took these uh, bricks. There's Heidi, my little girl, Heidi. <laughs> she helped out. And we made 400 of these. And the director was getting ready to push them into a kiln to cook. And I said, no, 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 hold on a minute. We need these bricks alive. And that's when he turned to me and said, what is going on here? What, you know, because I didn't tell him everything that we we're up to. I said, you know what, we'll sign something. And then I told him, you know, um, if these bricks are alive, they can stay alive for up to a year. Then um, they, could, they even dried. We can dip them in water, stack them, and then they will fuse together with that little bead of water and, and have a seal that is str as strong as steel. So it's a mortarless brick, a, a living mortarless brick, which means if I can do it here, then anybody can do it anywhere in the world with this fungus, which means they can build a house, they can filter water, they can eat the mushroom. That is clean water, food and shelter, three necessary requirements, right? Fulfilled by this one fungus. Unbelievable. So I'm very, uh, very excited about this one, these little living bricks, you know, or the, even the fungus. So we made, a, we made a pizza oven at work just to prove a point. We made the, the first myceliated clay or composite uh, pizza oven. It's at Mushroom Mountain. You can come on a visit and take a tour, but it's right there. And now it's completely covered with clay and it's, uh, it's in operation. Uh, this is from my book. And uh, this was a very late night idea. <laughs> so we started studying uh, the antimicrobial properties of mushrooms. You know, mushrooms, remember, create heat, carbon dioxide, and they sweat. So in that sweat are enzymes. They break down by chemical keys. They're, they're chopping up molecules and they're absorbing uh, atomic elements like, like through their cell wall. That's with how they work. They're absorptive. Um, uh, nutrition, but they also are exuding novel antibiotics. They're swimming through their own disinfectant, right? Like this. If you're at home, do this. <laughs> are some of you doing this? You may or may not. But this is what I do. I think about this. You have to. You have to put your. You have to think like a mushroom. So I'm swimming through this gradient of bacteria, and I'm sweating out novel antibiotics. I'm trying to kill things because. I want to take over this environment. Well, we, this is a cutting board, a hardwood cutting board, one piece. You can't use a laminated one because it'll fall apart. You get a one piece of wood cutting board, uh, soak it overnight in warm or hot water just to rehydrate it, and then add a mushroom culture to it, like a shiitake or turkey tail, sawdust spawn that you buy from somebody, put it in a bag, and it'll colonize the cutting board within a couple of days. And then you can take a, a, a paint scraper or an ice scraper and peel off the spawn. And now, you, do you know what you have made? You have made a cutting board that has an immune system. In other words, these fungi in this wood are defending themselves against predators or, or competitors, which include bacterial pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. And, and other food board pathogens. So you, you made an, a, a cutting board, a living cutting board that has an immune system. And if you just wash your cutting board, you know, once every, if you just rinse it off once every six months, it's gonna get enough moisture to stay alive, you know, forever. Uh, I can explain this. I know it looks suspicious. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, spores are adhesive. And uh, this is making a spore print. You can do this on glass and you can do it on a mirror. 
because spores are adhesive. If you do this on paper, you cannot harvest the spores uh, as, as uh, eloquently as you do here. So I do them on a mirror, and then I uh, take a razor blade, you can scrape them up into piles. There's millions of spores out of these spores. What we do is we took this um, spore solution, we put it in an inkjet cartridge on a printer, and then we started to print pages of paper. Black spores, all right, black ink is the, the top used ink, right? So what we're looking for is to replace chemical inks with living ink. In other words, we put uh, living spores, like living ink into these cartridges, and we're able to print these very uh, color fast, like they, they're, they're, um, uh, have a very long longevity as far as color fastness. And the idea is that short term consumer objects like newspapers, right? Um, things like this, and even books, you could print with sport ink. And if you were to compost that newspaper, let's say, or a flyer or a menu from a restaurant, and those spore, the sport ink, if it just gets wet, each one of these spores would wake up germinate, mate with the other one, and then they would take over. So it would be self-destructive packaging. Isn't that cool? I mean, we need to be thinking about these types of things. You know, I'm putting these things out there to hope that, you know, someone listening can say, mm, oh, hey, I've got an idea and I'll take this a little further and a little bit further, you know? Um, these are intima pathogens. These are fungi that attack insects. I love these. Um, absolutely, they're fun to find. This is a wasp with a mushroom growing right out of its neck. If you're if you're sitting at home or wherever you are, everybody like reach up and feel that little soft space right there, and just push in a little bit. It doesn't feel good <laughs> if you push in. Imagine, imagine a, <laughs> Kim's doing it. Imagine a mushroom coming out of there tonight. Hmm. Maybe after you watch this, you'll be infected and you'll be like, shit, the chat box will blow up. So I've been finding, these are all from South Carolina. We've been finding these here. So take the time to go out in your garden or in your woods and look for these fungi. These are commonly called cordyceps. And um, the Southeast fortunately has a huge population of these. And I'm in a candy land for, for cordyceps. This is another little wasp here. You don't see the wings are gone beautiful um, species to follow, the same as the other species growing out of the, the head of the wasp. Here's a cicada nymph. And this one's only been photographed once or twice. I'm not even sure. This might be the only photograph I, I might have heard. I think it's uh, Elaphocordyceps hesleri, I, I think. Don't beat me up on the chat. I just guessed. But I think that's it. Um, but a, a very rare find. This cordyceps for millions of years has host jumped from truffles to cicadas <laughs> back and forth. I mean, what a life, huh? So let's look at cordyceps. Look at, let's look at endomopathogens, pathogens, which could be the solution for chemical pesticides, which if you haven't figured it out, I'm somewhat of an activist. I'm not somewhat, I am an activist because we, <laughs> We are going to lose an expected 40% of all insect species on this planet in the next 20 years from habitat loss and pesticide use. The largest kingdom on the planet, 40% gone. It's insane. So let's look back to nature here. You got this fungus, is it like it exists like a mold, mold state? They call it an animal. And as soon as a suitable host comes along, like a particular ant or a wasp or a moth or a caterpillar or, you know, um, beetle, and then it mummifies them, it, there's behavior modification. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then mushrooms pop out of its body, right? Not all of them produce structures. A lot of them just sporulate, right? So here's some pictures from my backyard. Hmm. Pretty cool. An ant biting into the bud scar of a leaf. All right, so here he is again. 
All right, so let me tell you the story here. So this, le this ant was crawling around the forest floor and the spores are adhesive. They, a lot of spores are adhesive, so they just stick into the ants. Well, this spore sticks to this ant in particular and it's very specific to this ant. It melts, it drills a hole and it melts a hole through the armor of the ant and then it starts to thread up into its armor. And then it surrounds the brain with the mycelium. They first thought it invaded the brain. Now they're saying it just surrounds the brain with the mycelium and then it secretes uh, chemical molecules that cross the blood brain barrier and it takes over the ant and it tells it to climb up a tree, right? And it causes the ant to bite into the tree, melts the jaw muscles, kills the ant, and a mushroom pops out the back of its head, right at the base of the brain, straight down, targeting the rest of the colony, like positioning itself right over where that colony is. It's unbelievable. All right, so if you want to know more about that, go to Dr. David Hughes. Dr. David Hughes, he's now at the Penn State Laboratory. And um, he's, he's brilliant. Uh, his, his, I've seen a couple of his presentations in person. Uh, he's brilliant uh, with, with cordyceps, with behavior modification of these insects. So I'm out, I'm out collecting mushrooms. And I find these little threads growing out of a log. I dig open the log, not up in the tree. This is a different one. It's a huge, looks like a, a hornet, but it's actually a large carpenter ant, which turned out to be a queen. I sent it to Dr. David Hughes. He's like, where did you find that? I said, South Carolina. And he goes, we haven't seen that species of ant and that fungus in any literature since 1907. So it was a very rare find that I found by accident. So I cloned it. Uh, I took some of the tissue light stuff here. I could just take the dental pig or just break open the abdomen completely open and then get a little bit of tissue there put on a Petri plate and clone it. So that's fairly easy. You know, tissue culture, you only need to find one. So we're able to make millions of this stuff. And, uh, and, and as soon as we mummify black carpenter ants, uh, this is Campanotis, Pennsylvanica. And so it's a black carpenter ant. Then I decided I'd make fire ants in my house. And listen, you're in Oregon, you, you don't know what fire ants are. But if you're anywhere else in the, the Southeast or the world, you might know that this is an invasive species. So I made fire ant farms. I looked at the fire ants and the, um, the carpet ants were related genetically and they were very similar. They, were, they had um, parallel clades. They were right up branching from the same clade. So they might have some same similarities. Well, this is the, uh, the gallery four to five days later. We added the culture, and within four to five days, the red imported fire ants were completely mummified. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a, an ant that is causing four to eight billion dollars in damages every year in the United States. Not just that, it's the economic impact. It's the, the pesticides going into the ground, into the groundwater, and also the collateral damage of killing the species. Do you remember what I just said? 40% of all insects will be gone in 20 years. That is the vector. When people buy a fire ant killer, there's just a fire ant on the cover, but it kills everything. It kills fish, man, birds, you name it. It's not just the ant. So I'm hoping this, uh, this kind of biotechnology can be delivered and deliver us from this, this uh, spiral. We're in a downward spiral. Um, the, the cherry industry called me out in Oregon several years ago. They had a, uh, a problem with the spotted wing Drosophila, which is a, it, it attacks soft fruit, you know, cherries, blueberries, things like that. Uh, 2008, it was out in California. Well, you know about this one. Hell, when you were up in Oregon and Washington, spotted wing Drosophila, now poof, just like anything else. It's on, the, it's on the spread. So 
um, I advised them. I said, well, you need to make a most wanted poster like I did for the mushrooms or the Gulf oil spill. You got to show bugs and you have to show people like what to look for. Because if you can find just one bug or just a few bugs, you can get them into culture. Like this was done in Indonesia. This is, these are slides from uh, Cronson University. I get to give them credit for that. Uh, how they were able to find insects that were mummified. And if you, if you find an insect that is gripping tissue, plant tissue, biting into it or, or gripping it like around uh, like, a, like a grass stalk or something like that or a branch or even biting into it. Or if you see powder or structures on it, let somebody know, please contact me and, and at least take a picture and say, is this worth something? Because in Indonesia, they found some grasshoppers, crowned them up in a mortar and pestle in a little, in a hut, and were able to manufacture, look at this, two different strains, Bavaria and Metarizium, with no laboratory equipment, and put it back on the field, and they were able to eliminate locusts in the field without chemical pesticides. That's a big deal. Uh, I'm now gonna just cover quickly um, something, if you haven't heard of it, um, not so much a threat to you in Oregon, but uh, who, who knows where this one's going. This is the number one threat to American agriculture since the early 1900s. This is the spotted lanternfly. So I've got my uh, eye on this one. I've been watching it for about four years. And this, these are instars. So it goes from, from there to there um, to here to there. Uh, these are beautiful, but they are very devastating. And um, this is Pennsylvania. This is Pennsylvania. All right, this was several years ago. I will tell you, it's already down through Virginia and North Carolina, and it's, it's spreading very quickly. Um, this is a leaf hopping, like a sap sucking leaf hopper. They swarm the trees, they swarm grapevines, fruit trees. It's a nasty one. Um, the only thing that they're doing right now is systemically treating the trees, which costs about $200 a tree. And they're also wrapping the trees with sticky tape, which uh, unfortunately is, is trapping chipmunks and these beautiful uh, woodpeckers and things like that. So there's a lot of bycatch there that um, I, I, I hate to see that. So looking for alternatives, boom, you know, uh, I showed some slides from of the ants up in Pennsylvania several years ago, and a homeowner emailed me these pictures right here. Her name is Tori, and she emailed me. She goes, look what I found. She goes, I can't believe it. She said, you said to look out for something suspicious and unusual, and this is an invasive bug that's fully mummified. She goes, could this be an entomopathogen? And I'm like, yes. Look how they're coming out of the hinges. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, this is a dream come true. So an invasive pest coming over from, from overseas, there is a native fungus set up to mummify them, right? But it, it's not doing it quick enough. The bugs are spreading too fast. So what we've done was we've cloned this fungus. We've got it into culture. And our hopes are that we can develop it uh, not into a biopesticide, that takes too long. Since it was found in Pennsylvania, it should survive an EPA loophole, which means we can manufacture it and give it away at no cost. We can't sell it. So, I mean, who cares about making a sale on everything? This thing is going to destroy us, right? We've got to go out and fix the problem. Nature created that solution. So, as a community, we should be able to share that culture, even with common kitchen equipment. You know, I figured out a way to do that in the kitchen. You know, let's give this idea away. You know, this should be um, like a humanitarian type patent. There's Bavaria MET-52, which is a very good culture that, you know, mummifies the, the remote Varroa mite on the back of the bees. This is a, a U.S. years ago. MET-52 works really, really well. And it's a, a, a fungus, it all, not only attacks the varroa mites and doesn't hurt the bees, it also attacks brown spotted ticks. 
So if you're in the on the East Coast or the Northeast US, you're like, hmm, MET 52, uh, maybe spread it on my dog, cat, we go out in the yard. Uh, a quick, interesting plant, fungus, virus, symbiosis. I like this one. Um, this one's uh, rainbow crater. And uh, all these different colors are caused by different thermophilic bacteria. And yet we have plants right on the edge of the water here. This soil temperature, because of the water subsurface, these plants are sitting in a temperature, the roots that are 150 to 155 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, does anybody listening or watching know of any plants that can tolerate that? 155, so they looked in the plant, they found uh, endophytic fungi, that's interesting. And then they isolated the fungus from the plant, they purified both, put them back together and all the plants died at 155. That doesn't make sense. But then they looked deep, deep into the, the tissue of the fungus and they found a virus, right? They found a virus inside of the fungus that was living inside of the plant that would impart you know, the heat tolerance. So that is a beneficial virus. And if it's not colonized with the virus, it dies. So all bacteria are not bad, all viruses are and now we're looking at endophytes, plants that have fungi in their tissue, in their roots, shoots, and uh, in their leaves. And what they do as they grow is they channel that fungus. That fungus makes its way up into the seed. And that is why seed saving is so important. You know, that's why heirloom vegetables do so well, is that, you know, for centuries, thousands of years, people have seed saved and they've saved the best seed from the best plant. Well, there's fungal endophytes in there. You're not gonna save the seeds from the ones that are dying. You know, they didn't have the right endophytes possibly. So uh, everything you plant is a composite organism. And what we're trying to do or what they do is prevent leaf diseases like mildews, you know, and, and rusts and brown spots and all these different diseases. Um, these are some Patriot plates I threw away several years ago when I was at the EPA. Uh, typically, mushroom mycelium is symmetrical, okay, on a plate. It's beautiful, circular. But then uh, some contamination showed up, and then I saw this get uh, the, the symmetry stopped. And then I saw a surge of mycelium over a competitor uh, mold here, like an aspergillus. But this looks like an invasion map, and it is. This is biological warfare. And here's the droplets. Remember what I told you about earlier? This is uh, heat, carbon dioxide, and sweat. So it's using this as a, a means of breaking down something else. But this is carpet bombing this other mold. And I never saw this in pure culture, only in contaminated cultures. So what I started doing was starting to purposefully contaminate cultures so I could see what happens. Uh, so that was a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. That was a poisonous mushroom. It's, it's gorgeous. It glows in the dark. It's bioluminescent. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, a healthy jack-o'-lantern mushroom. I mean, you shouldn't eat it. It's poisonous. Uh, mushrooms are not poisonous to the touch. So you can just pick this. If you bring a healthy jack-o'-lantern mushroom at the right time, right age of maturity into a dark room and just wait about 60 seconds, you could actually read a book. There's that much light. This is what it looks like. Beautiful, bright green jack-o'-lantern, right, in the dark. So I created these behavioral galleries in a lab. This is a pastry plate. It's a fungus pellet and two bacterial pellets. That's what it looks like right there. So there's the fungus. And these are two pellets of E. coli. You know, this is what I do on Friday nights. <laughs> I don't have cable. I know some of you watching know, know me. Uh, I've got some friends watching. But, you know, I love this. I would, I would rather be doing this than almost anything else. And, you know, this is shiitake fungus and these two bacterial pellets just running like hell 
over here. There's a huge zone of inhibition here, and all these white cells are dead. So it's diffusing low molecular white cells into the agar gel here, uh, called the zone of inhibition. And it would do that. I can show you slide after slide. They all did it. Um, the problem is it could take 12 and a half to 15 years to make a uh, to identify and approve a chemical drug that's antibiotic through the FDA. And it takes mm, two and a half to three years for bacteria to figure it out. And if you don't know that um, bacteria are promiscuous, which means um, even within different species, they don't care. Uh, a bacteria can go across a chemical or antibiotic gradient and a drug resistant bacteria can actually come back through the gradient and, and download or upload the right genes to one that can't cross the gradient and then that one will move across the gradient. That's it. They are trading uh, mutant genes that can go across antibiotic gradients. It's, it's nuts. Um, it's a little frightening. So uh, that's with single molecular antibiotics. So I'm gonna suggest something else in a second. All right, so this is uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph, obviously not. We started working with MRSA at Clemson University uh, in the labs there. But this is on the new, this is becoming more and more prevalent. prevalent. All right, the more we use antibiotics, for no reason, people are, I mean, I, I don't feel good. I'm just gonna take an antibiotic. You know, if you have the flu, it's, it's not gonna work against viruses. So people are just taking leftover antibiotics and they're sold on the streets. We're pumping our meat and our food full of antibiotics. We're eating it. So of course, of course, these microbes are gonna figure it out, right? And. I like this quote, we can't solve problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So you have to act outside the box. So um, this may be an idea uh, that we developed at the, at the farm. And uh, we're working with this. We made, uh, these are myceliated uh, blocks and just like the, the Patriot plate you saw, little droplets. I don't want droplets, I want volume. So. We use Foamy's Fomentarius. This is the ice, one of the Iceman polypores that um, was found on OC the Iceman up in the Alps. But uh, there's some very good documentation about this one, E. coli. So I started with some literature, looked into this, and then I made some prototype bags uh, with different ports, like a pathogen port. I can't remember which one is which. This might be the pathogen port. Uh, rehydration port and a collection port. And so uh, we've changed everything now because of the patents. This is, uh, <laughs> I had to protect myself. I can show you this, but we, we put in the, um, you inject the pathogen in here, you rehydrate the cake, and then out comes um, the metabolite at the bottom. So we're kind of at the point where, you know, what can we do with this as far as the vision? The, I would tell you the vision is that we could take, um, a biopsy, a culture, pro culture, a skin culture of a bacteria, uh, at least a bacteria. We're not yet to, to cancer cells or viruses or anything like that, uh, or even a plant pathogen in the field. So it works with human and agricultural pathogens, fungal and bacterial, which is a big deal. And then we inject it into the, the culture or the module. That's it there, it creates a hydrophobic well. And then within 24 hours, you have, uh, uh, this bag has like 20 milliliters of fluid in it. And these are the controls lined up to the back. Uh, this 20 milliliters is still active 10 to the six, which, was, which means 20 milliliters uh, diluted a million times can make 528 gallons of antibiotics that could kill the E. coli that I put in there. So it's extremely potent. Um, and we tried it with maitake mushrooms. Again, here's the reservoir, and we changed the design uh, totally after we figured out we needed a robot to do it. These were just trials, so uh, they're now in different modules that a robot can do it. 
hopefully in a healing center or a hospital. So what we're looking for is a target specific and a patient specific antibiotic where you could go into a hospital and get a culture, come back 24 hours later and potentially that fungus would have manufactured a novel antibiotic compound that has a high, high, highly unlikely probability of becoming drug resistant um, you know, within 24 hours. So uh, shiitake and staph, shiitake scored high on staph. It wasn't the highest. I'll tell you now, because I'm not going to have the slides up. Uh, the highest that scored against staph was chicken of the woods. Chicken of the woods is a sulfur mining fungus. It's Lytiparus sulfurous. So the sulfur uh, based molecules are the ones that are working the best for staph. And uh, it mines sulfur from its food source. So it was, it was an easy one to find. Uh, also orange mock oyster worked really well. That's also a sulfur mining uh, mycelium. And uh, jack-o'-lantern scored one of the highest, the top three, but that's a toxic fungus. So um, chicken of the woods right now is the leader as far as safety. Um, turkey tail and salmonella scored the highest. So uh, now if you were gonna make a cutting board, <laughs> um, I would maybe suggest putting turkey tail mycelium on there, making a turkey tail cutting board, right? Um, for strep throat, a reishi mushroom, Ganoderma, scored the highest. It, it annihilated the strep, absolute strep. And uh, uh, drug resistant strep is actually uh, on the rise right now. So look at this streptococcus, streptococcus pyogenes uh, scored really high on this. These are all the water controls, all right? Water controls. So uh, reishi is readily available. You can grow it, you can buy it. Um, you can make lozenges out of it. This is me doing some inhibition studies. And I'm gonna end, I know I'm going a little bit late, but I had a delay, hmm, too bad. I've got about maybe five minutes left. And then, uh, so I do a lot of work abroad. Uh, I worked over in Haiti doing outreach. I'm going, um, if you know about cultivation, please teach more people about how to grow mushrooms. It's the, one of the most fulfilling things that I've done is gone abroad and uh, I've, I've lived in the Middle East. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen humanity um, uh, at its weakest moment. And um, here, one of the directors down in Haiti, I found oyster mushrooms growing out of a fallen mango tree. He'd never seen them there before. He'd been there for years. He just didn't know what to, didn't know where to look, you know, didn't think they were, they were there. And uh, we cloned those mushrooms. That group I found, we cloned them with cardboard. And we were able to set up workshops for the folks in the village there. The kids were begging for it in the streets. And it, it, look at this kid. It's like I gave him superpowers. He's got a bundle full of cardboard and mushroom mycelium. And that kid on the left said, I want to grow mushrooms so I can come back home to you know, go, go to the United States to be a doctor so I can come back and help my village, right? It's amazing what, uh, if you can touch the life of one person in one village anywhere in the world, what they're capable of doing. And um, I, that's why I love teaching the kids and growing mushrooms on paper and cardboard uh, like this in Haiti, um, just, just waste stuffed into a, a bucket from a little piece of cardboard. I mean, you can perpetuate these cultures so um, I do work um, now in Jamaica here. I do some work in Haiti, Jamaica, and now down in Costa Rica, uh, down here on the east side. And, um, and, and also I've been off in the Caribbean doing some consultations. But hey, while I was down there, I met the, I met the Minister of Agriculture, found out that I was on the island, and he, he demanded that I come speak. Uh, and and uh, and open up for his big talk about agriculture while I was down there. He just uh, picked me out and said, I need you to come. And he was fascinated by mushrooms. And so um, I do a lot of talks about medicinal mushrooms and, and, and I, I wanna put a little bit of a, a highlight on 
uh, the psilocybe species tier two, because down in Jamaica, I have a permit to do this. And now this is being decriminalized all over the US. Um, not all over, but you know, one state at a time, I should say. And if, if you have the opportunity to start this movement and get signatures and put this up in front of it and follow the, the coattails of what these other states have done that have gotten it legalized, contact them and get this to decriminalized at least. Hey, in my state, the Medical University of South Carolina just opened a psychedelic um, a medicine a research facility at Medical University of South Carolina, John Hopkins, NYU. It's happening over and over. Uh, what these mushrooms do is switch off the default mode network, you know, like the firewall for your brain. It lets you access um, that depression, anxiety, and, and do, do that kind of psychedelic surgery, you know, and I would highly recommend doing it with a professional. Um, we have the Blue Portal in Jamaica. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And I'm getting ready to go down there next week. So um, it really, here it is. You know, if you're if you've never foraged before, um, there's the deadliest mushroom in North America on the left and a hallucinogenic one on the right. It's psilocybe right next to each other. Now, there's no risk of contamination. You're not going to die from eating one next to another, you're not gonna, you know, hallucinate by eating the other. But here's the, here's the uh, if you had to pick one and you didn't know which one to pick and you had to eat one, the good news is no matter which one you eat, you will definitely see a light. <laughs> so I'm gonna end with this. We're down there growing um, fungi down for therapeutic use. Um, and uh, I've consulted Canadian companies. That's the Blue Portal. Oh, there's my daughter Heidi when she was little. Hmm. And that's that's it. So if you want to know more information about this, uh, don't go to that website. Go to um, you can search Mushroom Mountain Blue Portal online. It's a hidden link. You have to do that. Mushroom Mountain Blue Portal. You'll find it, and you can email me. Uh, we're out there hunting mushrooms out there. Uh, in Jamaica, and it's just a beautiful thing. I I think mushrooms have uh, just changed my life, and I, I think that they've taken over my brain <laughs> in a way. But what I think they've done is they've really shown me that um, all the different, you know, the inside language of plants and fungi that I never knew were there, and they're they're teaching me um, and uploading information into my brain to try to get more stuff back out to protect the planet. You know, this is a, a Lyme disease patient down there in Jamaica who's taking him and he was unable to walk and now he's driving a car because he was taking psilocybin and Lyme's man. You know, Lyme mushrooms are being used for, they have nerve growth factors in them. And there's Parkinson's patients that have, were in wheelchairs that are up cooking their, um, cooking their food and some are even driving a car. I mean, why would a mushroom manufacture these substances? It, I mean, they, for no evolutionary benefit to themselves, they don't need that. They don't have brains, right? And they're manufacturing compounds that affect and transform a mammalian brain. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty damn remarkable, right? So um, you really have to pay attention to this, that uh, you know, fungi are really maybe producing these things to, to say, listen, <laughs> we're the most destructive species on the planet. We need you guys to get healthy, <laughs> you know, change your mind and fix this place again, right? So here's Larry Evans over hunting oyster mushrooms in, in uh, Jamaica. So I'm gonna end it right there. Um, that is my actual CAT scan. <laughs> I'm gonna end right there. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. I know there's an opportunity to do questions, right? So um, that's my CAT scan, guys. <laughs> I got mushrooms in the brain. Thanks, Chad. That, uh, I, I didn't know you had that type of sense of humor. <laughs> it's pretty good. Me? <laughs> 
a few times you caught me there and laughed out loud. So. Uh, I'm in the final stages. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the final stages. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We'll uh, we'll start with a couple of questions. Um, oh, uh, Evelyn had a question, and she was asking if the bricks and the clay disintegrate over time. Um, yeah, they do. We put them out in in uh, like rain stuff, and they do pocket a little bit. So uh, if they're not fired. So, but if you build with them and just weatherproof them or paint them, they're they're fine. That's it. But uh, what's 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 great about those bricks is that uh, they're carbon negative. And when I talked to the brick research station, they said that was unheard of. And he, he also told me that sixty to eighty percent of all carbon emissions on the planet are from concrete and brick production not from cars, not from fossil fuel. It, well, yeah, fossil fuels, but from specifically concrete and brick production. Um, and somebody can double check that. That's not my quote, that's somebody else's quote, because I know this is gonna be on YouTube for a long time. <laughs> and everybody's gonna be commenting. Not my quote, check on it. Thanks, Dad. I know how this show works. There, there you go. Another question was, how long could could you theoretically keep the cutting board once you've inoculated it? Um, how do you keep it alive? I mean, it, it'll stay alive for a long time. It's probably going to outlive you. Yeah. Um, if you just wet it like once a year, I mean, I, I just I, I use my cutting board almost every other day and I rinse it off. It, ju it just it a little drink of water, uh, mushroom mycelium can stay alive for up to a year without one drop of water. So hypothetically, it could, it could last for years and years if you just rinse it a little bit. Now, if, if you completely soak your cutting board after it's colonized and put it into a bag, it'll probably fruit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is, which is kind of convenient because then you could just pick them and cut them right there. It's kind of, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I wouldn't do that to my little mushroom friends, you know. Fair enough. It's a it's a great party trick to bring out, though. Uh, later on, um, we have a question from Jordan. Uh, it's in regards to what was said about the different species of bacteria swapping or transferring genes between each other. He's asking, is that via plasmids? Say so, say so that question again. He's asking asking about the uh, bacteria that are swapping or transferring the genes between each other. He's asking, is, is that via plasmids? That's through the pili. That's through the tethers that they use. Okay. Yeah, they, they tether up and they, <laughs> they link and dock like with, a, with like a USB cable and they just unload. I mean, it's nuts. Jordan also, oh, there we go. Get her up there. <laughs> say, say hi to the world, Heidi. Hi. Hi to the world. This is Heidi, feature mycologist, right? Come on, Sam. Oh, it's <laughs> actually pretty good. Um, Jordan is also saying he has a sample uh, of an entomopathogenic fungus that he found in his garden. It's growing on an ant slash wasp like insect. Should he send you a photo? Yes, yeah, absolutely. They could send it to, uh, um, there, there's a link on Mushroom Mountain they can use. Yeah, I've got my contact information at mushroommountain.com. Please, yeah, I mean, because there's so many issues um, that we're tackling like Japanese beetles, we're talking uh, uh, pine beetles, you know, pine beetles in the Southeast, highly destructive, ash borer, longhorn Japanese beetles. It's like every, that's just the Southeast. <laughs> I mean, think about in your area in Oregon, I know about the, the spot of Winter Sofla, but there's everyone, everywhere, um, we have the woolly adelgid. I mean, they just go on and on. And um, I 
there is there could be a fungal solution for each one of these pests, but we we want to make sure that we isolate fungi that are bioregion specific, so we're not introducing another problem, right? Um, so you didn't really touch on it, but I'm interested in your nonprofits. I mean, how how is one person, um, and I'm sure you have others working on doing all of this. What are your nonprofits, and um, how can people support that? Uh, right now, I don't have a registered nonprofit yet. Um, I'm still setting that up, and okay. I'm clear. Um, I'm working on uh, a couple different ideas. That um, number one, it's with the psilocybin research, is for trying to generate funds for people who cannot afford treatment. Um, especially like, um, you know, low income and, and like a veterans association, like type veterans program. So we can get treatment for um, potential like veterans who, who have PTSD um, and things like that, that they can't get treatment for. I, I think that that's, uh, I, I know that people sh would fund that, you know? Um, I mean, I would, if, if I wasn't doing this, I would, if somebody else was doing this. Um, the others are for uh, maybe scholarships for students, because I, I, I feel like, you know, we need to entice, not entice, but encourage um, those students who have an interest and maybe a fascination with mycology to pursue a degree and, and uh, attend conferences and, and help fund them do uh, research. Uh, my, myco remediation experiments is another one. So I'm, I'm in the process kind of setting all that up. You know, <laughs> I'm into a lot of stuff right now, so I'm trying to do it one thing at a time and, and still define where I think the nonprofit um, entity needs to be. Yeah. Okay, because uh, you know, during your talk, you, you've talked a lot about helping people in other countries, helping with water, helping yeah. uh, with oil. You know, I see those as, as very, very important causes that I do think a lot of people, especially in the fungal community, because uh, we're so passionate about it, are, are willing to support and are willing to help you with. Yeah, so, and um, you know, if and I will get that set up. I'm, I'm, I'm still. It's been a two-year delay. We all know what happened in the last two years, but uh, I'm just really defining what the blue portal is and um, reshaping. Uh, my my um, my strategies with fungi and 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 also you know I understand the the challenges that are before us out there and um and 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 getting volunteers like anyone listening uh, you don't have to have a volunteer could be a you know with a degree or it could be a volunteer man I just want to help out you know with uh, with growing and, you know, you don't have to have, it could be any skill level. And um, that's what I liked about Haiti and, and, and volunteering in Jamaica. That, that was to me, nonprofit work through farmer to farmer program. But uh, now I'm, you know, I'm on my own here over there and uh, I've got to set something up and there's a, there's a need for it. Um, there's definitely a need for it. I've, I've seen some, um, I've seen, I've, I don't know. I mean, Middle East uh, when I was young, and then Haiti was was. Um, those those are some very challenging living situations I saw over there, especially in the refugee camps. So uh, that's that's very meaningful to me, and that's a, a big part of my life mission, is that uh, uh, bringing fungi to the people. Right? Ask not what you can do for your mushrooms. No, ask not what mushrooms can do for you, <laughs> but what you can do for mushrooms. Damn, I screwed that up. That's good enough. Th thanks, Trad. That's uh, that's really oh, okay. Can, can I tell a mushroom joke before we leave? Hey, we've got time. Um, did you did you hear about the fungus who fell in love with the algae? No. They took a liking to each other. And now their love is on the rocks. You can tell you're a dad. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's is that, a, is that a dad joke? Yes. No, that's a science joke. The science joke. Oh, more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, where's the best place to buy dried bulk lion's mane online uh, or in liquid concentrate? To, and if do you prefer one over the other? God, I mean. Dried, just dried fruiting bodies or dried extracts? It just says dried lion's mane. I mean, if you don't need hundreds and hundreds of pounds, I know Mushroom Mountain has it. Um, I was just talking to Olga there at the farm um, I, and we do mushroom extraction. So we've got plenty of liquid stuff, you know, if, you, uh, if you're looking for things like that. And um, I, I, I don't like selling from the stage. So just... <laughs> Contact Mushroom Mountain and we'll have a talk off the air. Sounds That's, good. Yeah, man. Um, Justina is asking, um, how specific are the cordyceps? Will they kill other insect species in addition to the target species? Um, there, it, some have a very narrow bandwidth of target specificity and some have a very, uh, I would say a wider range than I would hope for. Now, cordyceps mushrooms are, you know, the ones that produce the structures seem to be more target specific as a species. But the other ones, which are called uh, Bovaria and Metarhizium, those are entomopathogens. They are molds. They don't ever produce a fruiting structure like a cordyceps, you know, they don't produce a little spire. Um, those are more genetically variable, and those have a wider host range. Um, and so, I mean, so when you find one with a Bavaria or Metarhizium that's kind of in the mold state, what we'd like to do is we take them into the lab, and then we culture those on um, the actual insects, you know, the cuticles uh, in gel. You know, we just don't put them on regular media. So we try to keep the, the cuticle recognition going. Okay. Very, very Hannibal Lecter-ish, you know, or <laughs> it's, it's the creepy looking plates, by the way. It probably is exciting, probably makes for great photos. Oh, they do, they do. And then, on a Saturday night, they're like, what are you doing? You're, and you're like, I'm sifting the bodies of beetles. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, I remember in Telluride, you were talking about um, working with uh, termites and trying to develop a, was it a, is it a biopesticide for termites? And, and I was curious about how that was coming along um, right now. Gosh, how long ago was that? I mean. Uh, a, a while, it was a while. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that strain has been deposited. It, it's been discovered uh, for termites. Um, that's in the American Type Culture Collection. If you search that AT, atcc.org and you could look up termites, fungi, and, and probably find it. Um, I wasn't really working on termites that much, but I, I was actually working on trying to find something for Jamaica. <clears throat> because when I was down there, that's why the minister wanted me to speak at his, his talk. Um, he's, they, they said termites destroy 50%, 50, 50% of hurricane crop in Eastern Jamaica with spraying, with aerial, heavy aerial spraying, 50%. And I was like, oh, well, we could probably just go down there and find some abandoned termite mounds naturally and find a metarhizium. So now that I've got my lab set back up down there in Montego Bay, um, I can get into stuff like that again. But it's, it's just been a little bit of a, a pause. But those, those, those are, you know, anybody with a problem, um, there's, there could be a fungal solution out there, you know? So if you're experiencing um, pest pressure from something and that, that's heavily sprayed, 
you know, and uh, are able to go out and look and scout and find an insect, you're probably going to find it not in a conventional field. You're going to find it in an organic farm. So try to try to go find it, and then you know, dry it out, take a picture, and and um, email it to me, and we'll see if we can turn it around into something. You know, talk to the state where it was found in, and talk about the regulations, and talk about how you could manufacture this on your own without going through the EPA and the biopesticide registration and the lobbying against what you've got. You know, it's it's a big deal. Do you, do you think that's the limiting factor right now? I mean, it sounds like you have developed a number of these that are useful, could be useful, and could be useful to others. What's the limiting factor in keeping it from being distributed? Uh, it's it's the testing, uh, the funding, the the testing, which typically is done through a university, and uh, universities have lobbying interests, you know, with um, with uh, certain companies that, in order to get that data, um, you have to go through a university, and then there's the potential of an uh, intellectual property tie up there um, with technology transfer is what it's called. And they would want a piece of that. Then it has to go through the EPA. And a lot of the advisors on the EPA um, that are on the list for, I guess, walking that in as a biopesticide, if it's a entomopathogen, have, have, uh, have ties to some of the largest chemical companies in the planet. And um, so I, I think my approach would be shortly would be to approach uh, a couple companies. I've got a few on my radar that have already developed earth friendly entomopathogens and go directly to them and use their pathway versus the traditional pathway. So this kind of uh, piggybacks on that question. And oh, I just a shout out. So people, um, you know, Chad is here answering the questions we have. So please, if you have any other ones, put them in the chat. Um, so I guess my next question to you is, have you been approached by a number of companies to purchase some of your findings? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and not to use, right? Am I, am I right that they just like to shelve it? Well, I, I, I wouldn't go there. I mean, um, I, I would say that I've been approached um, and given given business cards at, uh, or emails from from certain companies or entities, whether they're in the pesticide, but even the medical field with the novel antibiotics, that was the big one. And uh, said, "Oh well, you know, we can take this, we can fraction it, and we can synthesize it, and then we can make it into a drug, and then now you're now you're back to square one again. Now you're not." approaching it from the same direction that I am, that, which is a, a, a fraction purified molecule is gonna be easily figured out by a bacteria quickly versus a cocktail, right? Um, so I, I would just hand them the card back, Kim, and I would just say like, you're exactly who I don't wanna work with. <laughs> just like that. I, and I know that there's companies that I'll, I'll eventually find that I'm that it's just going to take good licensing and good attorneys to make sure that you know this is uh, I, I feel like you know we make things that people need, not what they want. And um, if it's something people really need, there's a there's a, a value to that. And I want I want this to be for the people, you know. What what good is what good is anything if people can't afford it? You know the psilocybin companies are trying to synthesize it and sell them pills for seven thousand dollars a pill. So here we go. You know, everybody's like, "Oh, decriminalization!" Well, now here we go again. And now they're sticking their finger in in and uh, <laughs> the next big mental health problem and antidepressants are the number one class of drugs taken in the United States. <laughs> and, you know, before COVID, 30,000 pharmaceutical related deaths right now, a year, 
right now, 110 to 120,000 a year. So, you know, it's the mental health of, um, you know, people and, and civilization, humanity is very, um, very important. That's, that's fine. You know, that, that should be front line. What, what good is anybody or anything if, if we cannot heal ourselves and, and uh, be content and, and happy individuals, right? I want to definitely thank you for taking the time. I know that the time shift for you is a little different, um, <laughs> a little further ahead. And I guess the, the last question I had, if you had all the time in the world, what is the thing that you would like to like to research or like to look at next in in this realm if i had all the time in the world yeah yeah time and money i guess is what what no other nine questions are out there i mean your mind is so diverse but that's a deep question <laughs> <laughs> the first thing i thought about if i had all the time in the world and i was like oh i would just play my guitar and just take a minute that's um, okay it's said right here. Um, what's interesting is my answer today will be different than tomorrow or 10 years from now, because if you answer that, if you ask me that five years today, back when I wasn't probably even looking at antibiotics or, you know, Michael Pest, it, it's just so it's, it's always evolving. It's good to have an ODD mind. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's all good. I mean, I, I think that I, I always try to put, well, the psilocybin is right there, you know, but the antibiotic one is a big deal. I think this is the one that I want to explore, um, get, this, get this thing under belt and into the hands of people who can run with it. Um, and then then I could change, like switch to something else, you know, there, there's, there's multiple levels of things going on in the mushroom kingdom. Um, and, and, on, and in my neck of the woods that I have, and I always keep my pulse on all of them. You know, I just, uh, some, some are moving faster than others. Some are sh not shelved, but just kind of put on hold for a minute because they're, they, to me, they're not just as an important as something else, but um, yeah, I, I think antibiotics are, are, uh, are huge, but then, but then it's like, all of a sudden you have, <laughs> you have this global crisis and not, now I'm starting to thinking about, you know, refugee camps, you know, and now I'm, so then I might just say, oh, where do I devote my time? So then I start getting calls from beneficiaries and rich hippies and, and uh, just kind of put maybe some of my projects off and to the sides. I miss deadlines because it's like there's humanitarian causes always, they cut the line for me, you know? So I always stop and pause and say, okay, you know, now you have two and a half or whatever, one and a half million refugees in Poland or after the Syrian crisis or after the earthquake in Haiti or tsunami, you know, it's, it's just like, uh, it, it puts, it puts a pause on just work and, uh, humanitarian efforts come first for me. That's, 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 that's what's near and dear to me. So. That's fair. Um, if you, if you want now, uh, you've got a book that you'd like to share with us or you know your website magic mountain um oh, what's your mountain not magic mountain. whoa there uh there you go i got a slide there I you go that. uh yeah that's my book organic mushroom farm remediation you can um at mushroom mountain if you want me to write you a little love note in there in the front first part of it and it supports Mushroom Mountain. Um, if you, it's easier for you to order on Amazon. If you can't get anywhere else, it's there. Uh, and also through Chelsea Green is my publisher. Wonderful, wonderful publisher. And they got 
amazing titles of other books. If you're into gardening and, and that political sphere of uh, of uh, equality, they're they're they've, they're very picky about their authors. Um, as ChelseaGreen.com, uh, and also Blue Portal Mushroom Mountain. If you search that, you'll find my hidden page and Mushroom Mountain. Go there, and you'll find links to me. Huh. All right. And oh. And the Telluride Mushroom Festival this year. There you go. Right. Um, and I was just added to the board of directors. I just feel so honored. What a dream come true. Um, yeah, um, I was a track director. And now they now they uh, took a chance and added me to the board. <laughs> well, good, oh. good. Hopefully some of us will be out there and see you and our good times and uh, everyone yes. else. Please do come out. If you've never been, look up Telluride Mushroom Festival. Uh, the Telluride Institute is the website, the council, and uh, come out. If you've never been out there, it's just uh, absolutely amazing. I will be there this year and as, as many years as I can. As I can. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. Is there any more questions or are we wrapping it up? No, nope. that, is, that is all I see. So with that, we just want to say Thank you, and we will uh, see everybody next month. And that's the it 